Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany Zhang and I'm the founder and host of Empathy Gaps, an online YouTube video podcast. Welcome to episode 7! When we are sad, some of us listen to sad music repeatedly. It is common knowledge that music can help us when we are sad or stressed. However, did you know that over listening to these types of music can actually hurt us more than help us? For example, if you are sad, It is good to listen to sad music to validate your feelings. However, over listening to sad music can actually hurt us. Fortunately, we can utilize music therapists to help us find a healthy balance. In this episode, Julia Pinkerton and I will discuss overindulging in a certain type of music and how to find a balance and the customization of music therapy. She also shares a heartwarming story about how music therapy saved her father's life. Here is my conversation with her. Hi everyone, and welcome to Empathy Gaps, an online video podcast focused on creating a safe space to discuss mental health and psychology, while also working to address the needs of the current mental health crisis. I'm Tiffany Zhang, your host, and today we have a very special guest, Judith Pinkerton. Judith Pinkerton is the founder of Music for Life, TED speaker, and violinist. She was also the first person to receive a music therapy license in the USA. Thank you so much for being here today and taking the time to join me. Before we start, is there anything else that you want to add regarding to what you do and who you are? Oh, there's way too much. We don't need to go into it unless it just comes up in conversation. (laughs) Okay, so I guess my first question is, what inspired you to become a music therapist and found Music for Life? Hmm. So I had a hospital experience um, where my solo violin music replaced routine post-surgical high blood pressure medication in hospital. And I didn't understand how that could possibly it happened. (laughs) So it ignited my passion for wanting to explore music as a healing agent and then bumped into the music therapy profession and said, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And then I guess I was also watching your, like your TED speaker thing, I think. So I guess, can you kind of explain your three-part formula for music medicine? Oh, okay, we'll dive right in. <laughs> um, so when you think of your broad continuum of emotions, uh, we're always going to feel anxiety, anger, depression, sadness, peace, joy. You know, that's our broad spectrum. And it's how long you stay stuck or trapped in the unsettled emotions, particularly that can cause problems, you know, negative behaviors and so on. Um, So the music medicine protocol um, helps to adjust moods, um, to support mood control, but not by suppressing or repressing emotions, um, but by actually neutralizing the unsettledness so that you can truly feel a deep sense of peace and joy. And it's just, it's an amazing process when you do a mood sequence that honors all of your moods. So in order to do this, you have to be very aware of your moods (laughs) and what you would call them. Um, There are some danger zones to consider uh, when looking at these three mood categories. Um, For instance, if you're feeling energized a lot, If you're trapped in anger, it's going to have you interpreting your energy possibly as being energized all the time. Um, And then our usual music listening habits are pushing play on music that feels good to us. So if we're trapped in anger that we're recognizing as being just high energy all the time, um, you may enjoy listening to metal all the time or uh, a variety of different um, subcategories off of metal. Metal is really, really good at, particularly at addressing anger. Um, So interestingly then in this protocol, you'd say, oh, well then I shouldn't be listening to metal if it's going to be fueling my anger, right? (laughs) It's actually the opposite. Um, In this protocol, we're recommending that you actually listen to it to help you express out in a healthy way, the anger. Um, The challenge is if you become entrapped um, in anger, um, you could have 
become in a sense desensitized to its effects. Um, so sometimes we have to find other music that could also be have a prescriptive strength of of that mood. So it's an interesting journey to go on once you start becoming aware of all of your emotions and being able to accurately describe them instead of misinterpreting them. So anger is one mood that is a danger zone. Another mood is anxiety. Um, if you're feeling excited all the time, sometimes it's actually masking anxiety uh, or you're interpreting yourself as being excited all the time when you're actually trapped in anxiety. Um, and then panic attacks and you know other things related to anxiety can uh, become a problem. So then the music listening habit connected to it is listening to music that you know can actually keep you trapped in anxiety. Um, a music style that I've found uh, many people like to listen to who do uh, confess or share that they've got an anxiety uh, problem uh, is EDM. Interestingly, EDM is layered. Um, it ten, and this is everything I say is so general. You know, there is no like one one hundred percent. This is the answer <laughs> because music and emotions are so subjective. Um, however, with EDM, imagine that it usually has like a fast foundation of music that matches that anxiety and actually contains it. Um, and then it's got sometimes this, or often this soothing balm on top, you know, like a, a nice soothing voice on top of this rhythm bed, right? And so what it's doing is trying to soothe you down at the same time it's containing the anxiety. And, and actually uh, what it does is keep you stuck there um, and helps you to just sort of contain it, but not get rid of it. So um, it's, it's interesting then to decode, you know, your music preferences and look at how you would classify them into these specialized mood categories um, for prescriptive strength and calling then a prescriptive playlist that we have fondly called the music medicine pill, like you see in the background. Um, there's still one more danger zone. So we've talked about anger and anxiety. The third danger zone is depression. So same thing, uh, people could who are trapped in depression could be feeling calm and then fueling the depression with music that actually keeps them stuck there. And the, the real danger part of that is the spiral down and potential attempts at suicide or death by suicide. And so it's a serious problem. Being able to have conversations with people about music listening um, and just exploring and validating, you know, what we enjoy and, and understanding that even if you have opposite opinions about a piece of music, you're both right. <laughs> this is not about one person being right about everything. This is about understanding how to grow empathy empathy, empathy to uh, allowing others to be comfortable and sharing what their music is and of what value is it to them. And in that dialogue opens up the possibility of a greater understanding about how music does affect us physically, emotionally, and behaviorally. So it's a very deep medical protocol that we could talk about for hours. In fact, we have training programs that are certifications for licensed clinicians, as well as athletic trainers, educators, peer support specialists um, who can uh, take the music medicine specialist training. So there's a clinical specialist training. There's also a music therapist training. And then for anybody that just wants to get in and do self-care, we have an advisor training. So it, it's intense. It goes anywhere from four hours to nine months of training, depending on which level um, you want to get more information. So this is really about empowering everybody to do it themselves. You know, we don't have enough mental health providers out there. And this kind of system 
supports you learning how to do it yourself and taking this phenomenal resource of music and recognizing that all music genres have a place in this protocol. So tell me, Tiffany, when you think about um, healing music, you know, what's healing music for you? Healing music, I'd say for me specifically, would probably like when someone says healing music, I think more calmer music, more like mellow music, more sad music. I feel like that's kind of what people think when they think healing music. But I guess, yeah, you know, something yeah. that's going to calm my nerves. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess so healing like music um, can be found in all three mood categories. Right. Mm -hmm. So soothing, soothing categories is definitely one of those uh, three mood categories that you were talking about earlier. Um, so we've got unsettled music, soothing music and energizing music. Energizing music is really referring to music that makes you optimistic and enthusiastic and happy. Mm -hmm. um, whereas unsettled music is addressing the anxiety, the anger, the depression, the sadness. And then, of course, soothing is looking at that. I mean, totally tranquil, right? Um, so healing music, it's interesting uh, that uh, that's usually what people will tell me is that, oh yeah, it's something that just soothes me, right? Calms my system down. So my recent hospital story, um, <laughs> uh, let's see if I can get through this without some tears. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's recent and it was pretty dramatic. Um, so my, uh, father found himself in an ICU unit with less than 24 hours notice in another state, um, with confounding factors. It wasn't just like one thing that was wrong. Um, but the bottom line was he was being given comfort care, um, and the hospital was expecting him to die most likely that day. Uh, and so there were just three people present. Um, and it was interesting as I think about my own journey with breast cancer and, you know, what it takes to, to journey through something that's real significant in your life. I've discovered that we need three teams, right? We need a good prayer team. We need a good medical team and we need a good alternative method team. Um, and so it was interesting in that ICU unit, we had all three present. So my cousin, who happened to be um, an emergency uh, nurse, um, flight nurse, as a matter of fact, of decades, as well as a physician assistant, was the one that said, he needs to get to the hospital right now, or he could die within 24 hours. And I'm like, what? So he was present. So he was our strong advocate with the medical team. Um, my mother was present. So both my parents are 92. Um, and so she was in her prayerful state because she had no other, she didn't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had to have my music therapy tools with me. Um, <laughs> so I noticed um, after we decided that he would not be intubated because that would take away his choice for life. Um, and the team was like, well, then, you know, he's just going to die. <laughs> so... Um, I was noticing he was really struggling with trying to breathe. And so um, I got the violin out and I started playing a couple pieces for him. And I did like what you were thinking, right? Soothing, just need to soothe him down. So I picked a couple pieces that were very meaningful for him. Uh, he was my violin teacher. And so I played pieces that he had taught me to play a long time ago and that he also enjoyed playing when he was a kid. Um, and so I noticed that, you know, I had to adapt how I played it, never played it like that before. Um, being in an ICU unit, you have to be very mindful about physiology, physiological responses. So I had monitors I was watching and all this. So I noticed that I was able to calm him down with a much reduced time uh, on the pieces, not playing full strength. Um, and as soon as I played, the, here we go. As soon as I played the last note, ah. Uh, my cousin said, okay, we need to all gather around the bed. He's about ready to take his last breath. And, uh, something inside me bubbled up. And I remember yelling at him, 
saying, no more soothing music for you. We need to get some energizing stuff going on here. So I pushed play, had that portable, powerful command center in my phone. I pushed play on uh, Chamber Symphony and it filled the ICU unit because I just happened to have my Bose speaker <laughs> right next to him. And uh, I got my music out quickly and, and started wailing on the violin. So it wasn't soothing music. Yeah. It was energizing stuff. And the piece of music happened to be one that he not only taught me, but I have siblings that have, he's also taught. Um, he was also our orchestra conductor. And uh, so he's conducted it as well. So I played the first movement, was watching his vital signs and there was, wasn't not much change. Um, so I skipped the second movement because it was soothing. Jumped to the third movement, which was even more energizing. And um, by the time I got to the end of the third movement, it started conducting. He started conducting me, still being unresponsive. The medical team had already arrived. And when I finished the last note, because he was like this, conducting me, <laughs> I'm like, really, Dad, you're not going to cut me off? You, you know, I mean, it's like, seriously, you just want me to keep laying that last note? Um. So I turned around and saw the medical team and they all, their mouths were open, <laughs> just watching what had occurred because he had turned blue. He was cyanotic. He had extreme hypoxia with the purple black tongue. He had stopped breathing when I started playing the music and his pink color came back. He started breathing um, and his monitor readings went to normal within minutes. So I used energizing music to make that happen. So Thank the you. music can be a variety of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that story. I'm glad that like um, that story did um, have, have, I guess, a happy ending with like your energizing music and stuff. But I guess my question from that would be like, is that usually the case with music therapy? Like is music therapy usually something like very quick that can happen that can like change results instantly? Or is it usually a more gradual process? Any and all of the above, any and all of the above. So a music therapist um, usually does, you know, assessments in the medical setting, you're having to do assessments on the fly, meaning that you come into a room and you're assessing everything right then and making determinations with, without having them fill out paperwork about what you know you need to do for them. Um, so depending on the setting that you're working in depends on what kind of assessment is being done. Uh, so it can be quick, quicker. Uh, sometimes in some settings, you only get to see a patient or a client one time. So you have to make a difference as much as you can in that one time. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some that are much longer. I currently have a client that I've been seeing for years, doctor's orders, um, because of mental health conditions. And music therapy is literally what is keeping the patient or client alive. So it's, it can be long-term, it can be short-term. Music to, with a specialist, a music therapist that's board certified and has to be licensed. There's now 18 states that require some sort of state recognition, usually a license, um, in order to practice. And so we're, we become well-equipped in the populations that we choose to work with uh, and how to make music work quickly uh, for long-term benefit, not just short-term. Mm -hmm. And then kind of going off of that, I know in the beginning of this interview, you talked about how like anger and metal, I guess, kind of go together. For music therapy, is it usually like your, so like if someone is like really, like as an example, like if someone is really sad, you would give them sad music or would you try to give them happy, energizing music? Um, yeah, we like to validate first. It's called the ISO principle. So it's, it's mood matching. It's, it's wanting to make sure that you're validating what the mood is that's present. Otherwise you could be repressing or suppressing it. And so 
I always want it to be a healthy expression of whatever the mood is that they're experiencing and then not stay stuck there. So it's uh, about the processing then. And there's a variety of ways to process uh, from music making, music listening. There's just lots of processes. And you'll find that every music therapist um, is very individualized with their preferred methods, with their preferred instruments. Um, all music therapists have to have proficiencies in uh, vocal, piano, and guitar. And then they've all got their own preferred instruments. So for me, for instance, my preferred instruments is violin. Um, so in order to even become a, a music therapist, you have to audition to get into the music department of an approved music therapy program. And so there's over 80 programs across the country in university or college settings where you can do that. Um, and then you major in music therapy instead of music education, music performance, music technology, music business. I mean, there's a host of other music kinds of uh, degrees that you can get, but music therapy is available in over 80 different institutions across the United States. And of course, in other parts of our world as well. Mm -hmm. And then I know in the beginning, you mentioned like, va like validating the feelings, but also making sure that it doesn't become like toxic or like consuming, I guess, how can we kind of like, find a balance between like over indulging in a certain type of music? And I guess, like, how can we recognize when music gets toxic for us? If you find yourself, well, okay, so this is a, this is a sign that maybe you're self-medicating with music. Uh, if you're finding that you have to listen to it 24 seven or what you don't want to feel comes back because it's not working now. Um, and all you're doing is keeping yourself trapped and stuck there. Mm -hmm. So the kind of mood sequence formula then that we recommend is choosing music from an unsettled um, feeling category uh, shifting then into soothing, then shifting into energizing. That's kind of the generic mood sequence. There could be other mood sequences that we recommend. Um, but the whole idea is that your, your mood matching then, whatever the unsettledness is, um, some people are experiencing four major unsettled areas like anxiety and anger and depression and sadness. It's like this confusing unsettledness that it's even hard to describe what it is because they're so trapped in it. Um, and imagine being able to shift into soothing music that basically neutralize the unsettledness. You're able to release it and go into this peaceful area. And then nonstop, you go right into energizing. It's important in using what we call the entrainment mechanism to make the flow easy to shift. Um, and so a music therapist, uh, really is best equipped with making sure that entrainment mechanism is done correctly in order to successfully be able to shift, uh, moods, but it's, it's truly a cathartic experience that can happen for those that are trapped in unsettledness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And then. Also, another question that I had is like when curating songs, like, is there like kind of like a universal set of songs? So like, for example, if you're putting sad music in a playlist for a person, I guess like, would you give them that same, would you give like another person that same sad song or would you, is it more like a variety? Especially when it comes to grief, grief is very personal, very personal. And usually what I'll want to do is go to that memorial service if there was a loss mm -hmm. and find out what music was used and played at the memorial service because that may be good strength in, in being able to bring up those tears uh, so that you have a really healthy expression of that. And, you know, it's uncomfortable for some people. And then there's others that that's all they listen to because... They're honoring, you know, it's, grief is an interesting thing. Um, you know, it, it's almost like this um, unsaid truth that I need to be sad to honor 
yeah. my loved one that passed to be happy is not honoring them. Why would I want to be happy about them passing? I have to be sad. So then you listen to sad music that actually keeps you stuck there. What this process does is allows you to go into a space where you're honoring your loved one differently and you find yourself remembering them differently, maybe doing things or saying things that they would do or say that honors them from a different place. And you shift into this more happy place that honors them and, and recognizes that, oh, you know what? I don't need to be sad to honor them. I can do things from a happy place that honors them. Um, but we can get stuck in the grief and not see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the part of, about what you said, like, if you're grieving over someone, you feel like you feel like you have to like be sad forever to honor them. But I feel like that's, like, as you said, like, not true. And I feel like something I've like kind of like summarized and learned in this interview was that music therapy is not universal. I don't know why I feel like before I kind of thought as like, like universal music and that like, everyone gets like the same song and like everyone gets the same sequence but I feel like from this interview I've kind of like learned that music therapy is like very detailed and very intricate and like very personalized to, like the person that it's serving and then yeah so it's interesting so we have a music medicine protocol and um and then there's music therapy so music therapy is all about the therapeutic relationship between the music therapist and the client Mm -hmm. Okay, so that the agent of change is actually the therapist. In music medicine, it's the music that's the agent of change. Mm -hmm. So in music therapy, it's the music therapist that's the agent of change. In music medicine, it's the music that's the agent of change. Mm -hmm. And then music as medicine, I guess, can you kind of talk about like your thoughts on that phrase? Like, do you think that music is more powerful than medicine? Or like, do you think that music is like kind of like some like a term that's like kind of under medicine like I guess kind of give me your thoughts on that phrase music therapy fits with integrative therapies and <clears throat> it absolutely can have strong effect on the healing process and needs to be considered seriously by the medical profession um, there are teams of medical professionals that absolutely swear by music therapy being a part of what they offer. Um, <clears throat> is it more important? No, it's it's very important. Um, you know, it's like I was describing in the in your process of healing. You need you know really three strong pillar or pillars, right? A prayer team, a medical team, and an, an integrative therapies and an alternative therapies team where whatever it is that you consider alternative, if you're very strongly entrenched in that, you know, utilize it, have somebody there that can support you with it. Um, music has this ability and this capability of activating our central nervous system. And it has whole brain effect um, where it can significantly change uh, the chemical structure in your body. So um, it really does need to be seriously considered um, over any other modality uh, because it has such a, an overarching comprehensive effect on the system. Mm -hmm. And then talking, going off of like music's like powerful capabilities and like effect on our minds and like chemical like structures, I guess, like, do you believe that music is more powerful than medicine in a way? Um, it has less, uh, side effects. Medication mm -hmm. tends to have a whole, whole list of side effects. Mm -hmm. And then you may need another medication to combat the side effects of the first medication, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In yeah, music no. therapy, it's a little bit more clear and not so confounding. Um, yeah. Once you understand how the protocol works. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So. Yeah, no, I actually, yeah. And no. I, I will say that. Um, yeah, with the, with my experience in clinic, <laughs> particularly working with more than 11,000 
uh, patients in residential addiction treatment centers over the last 10 years, um, because of physician advisement, patients have done one of three things. They've either reduced their medication or they've eliminated their medication or they've gone on medication as a result of music therapy and this particular music medicine protocol. Mm -hmm. And then- uh... So music therapy can absolutely affect the symptomology that medication seeks to um, affect. Mm -hmm. I guess I was just kind of curious because I feel like when I was learning about music therapy, I feel like I heard a lot of stories where people said that medicine didn't work as a treatment, but music did within like instants or seconds. So I guess I was like curious about your opinion on that kind of statement. And I feel like those stories, like in my personal opinion, kind of made me to believe that like music could potentially be more powerful than medicine in some cases. And then um, I have to agree. I've had that personal experience myself, um, but it has to be <clears throat> strongly advised with physician support, you know, because music therapists don't know everything. You know, you really need to be a part of a team um, where everybody has got valid input um, into a patient's well-being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like when used right, music, like when you, I guess like used correctly or used right, music can definitely be, music therapy can definitely be a very powerful tool and I guess kind of going on like I guess how do you feel that like music can help with alleviating the current mental health crisis oh. so good timing we just launched our kickstarter campaign for the music app called key to me oh so it's k-e-y the number two, M-E-E, -E. M-E-E, -E, it stands for you, not me. And it also is an acronym, meaning music exercising emotions. <clears throat> this um, music app is scheduled for development and launching in September, um, assuming that we get all the funding in. And so, you know what a Kickstarter campaign is all about. <laughs> they get them, got to get that first goal done. Um, so imagine being able to have an app where you're able to create your own music medicine pill, your own personalized playlist on the app mm -hmm. with the assistance of the algorithms, possibly some coaching by um, our network of specialists and being able to then have mood control being able to significantly reduce anxiety, anger, depression, and sadness in as little as 15 minutes and have a, a regimen that's set up with listening and tracking on physiology, on your moods, on your behaviors, so that you can see how this is working for you. Imagine having an app in your pocket that does that. That's what Key to Me is going to do. Mm -hmm. And so looking at the mental health crisis, I think that there is a lot of um, support for people to understand what it is and what do we need to do. And music has such a huge impact on our mental and emotional well-being. Raising people's awareness about how music influences so that their music listening habits can shift and change. We have uh, six habits of music medicine for highly empowered people. It got, um, it's a boxed cards deck that you can actually buy a friend um, with 30 therapeutic music listening activities in it. Well, the National Alliance on Mental Illness decided that they wanted to, at their Southern Nevada chapter, make it a curriculum and make it available over a six week uh, period of time to their members. And so they did a class and they had um, their peer support specialist trained as music medicine specialists to be able to facilitate it. But the responses were really wonderful with how, oh my gosh, I had no idea that music was so important in my life to really understand how it influences my behavior, my emotions, my mindset. Yeah. So 
that's how I think we're going to address the mental health crisis is getting a handle on music because music is pervasive everywhere. And uh, some, a lot of the music is keeping us trapped. Mm -hmm. And then um, I guess my last kind of question is, why do you think that the music therapy industry like is kind of like small or like niche? Is like what now? Is small. Like, why do you believe? Because I feel like, because I feel like music therapy with its like powerful benefits and stuff, I feel like it should be like a very, I guess like well known or like popular like field, I guess, but I feel like it's not as like popular as it deserves to be. So I guess like, why do you think that is? Yeah, we've been growing the profession for a while. There's about 10,000 of us now in the United States. So you think, wow, 10,000 is a lot, but not really when you compare it to other professions. Um, there's actually a shortage of music therapists. So anybody that's wanting to consider coming into the field, yes, do it. Uh, the government is offering six-figure salaries because we have a shortage of music therapists. There's hundreds of jobs going unfilled. So mm -hmm. it's important <laughs> that we get more music therapists in the field. I also think that People underestimate um, the need for music therapy because music's so available. Like, why do I need a music therapist? You know, I've got my music. Music is my therapy. I'm already doing it. So I think it's just increasing knowledge about how music therapy is actually effective uh, from womb to tomb, cradle to grave, uh, in all these different work settings. And why would you possibly want to you know, tap into using a music therapist when you do it yourself. All you got to do is put earbuds in <laughs> and you're immediately transformed into another place. Uh, the challenge is how can you maintain that? Or do you be, need to be listening to it all the time in order to stay there? So mm -hmm. it's interesting when you start using music prescriptively, it's amazing how you actually listen less because it's containing and uh, also providing a catharsis for experiencing more peace and joy in your life. So music mm -hmm. therapists can help facilitate that, whether it is working with people with disabilities, um, in medical settings, school settings, uh, treatment settings. There's so many settings available um, and all generations benefit from music therapy. Mm -hmm. So it's just think, increasing this, like with your podcast. Thank you. I think, yeah, I think just raising awareness, but also I like what you said about like how mu music is so available. Like, I feel like people already like think that they're using, like they feel like they don't need a music therapist. And also I feel like some people like they think that they can like do it themselves, I guess, because like they know what music, which type of music makes them feel good. But I feel like some people don't know, like they can't really tell the difference between like, listening to it like too much and like having it actually like trapping you instead of like releasing and just like making you feel better yeah exactly and there's there's something that um my clients love to do we call it faves where we kind of decode whatever they're thinking about listening to um and so we want to find out you know is it is it like a an earworm stuck in your head or is it like bringing up memories or is it describing your life? And so we go down this path to really understand, you know, what what is it um, that how you're relating to the music and then the earworm can actually decode what's happening in your life and how you need to shift and change, maybe depending on that music and how it relates to what your life conditions are. And once you can understand what the music is saying about your life conditions, it's very possible that it'll stop being an earworm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And yeah, I guess that was like kind of the end of the interview. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I really enjoyed our interview. I feel like I actually did learn a lot of things like genuinely. So yeah, thank you so much for coming on and speaking with me. Thank you to everyone watching and see everyone next time. Bye.